Um, I want to talk tonight about understanding the scriptures. And so why don't you grab a hand? You can also, uh, as you know, most of you have been here a long time, you can get a date <laughs> and you can pray at the same time. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing tonight and we bless what you're doing. Lord, we bless what you're doing and we pray, God, that you would open up our minds to understand the scriptures. Lord, I pray that it would be like the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the Bible and had no idea what it meant and, and how Philip just gave him keys to, for the word to be understood by him. Lord, we pray that that same thing would happen for so many people tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to talk about the scriptures tonight. I just want to say, you know, when you have stuff for people like the word of knowledge, it's really important that you give it whether or not people respond. Two things happen, and this has nothing to do with prophetic word, but I mean with the, with the scripture, but this prophetic word. I, I, just, I, I just think it's a great example. Like I, I have uh, done, you know, prophesied over people for, I don't know, over 40 years. And I, two things that I've come to understand. First of all, sometimes you call people out, especially publicly, and they totally forget that's their name. <laughs> or they come up after, and they're just, they're just terrified to stand up in a public setting, especially if you say something about a lawsuit. And the third thing I've found is oftentimes people will, um, in, in this kind of a setting, somebody who's streaming will text in and say, that's my name, that's my first and last name, I'm actually in a lawsuit. And so I find that it's really important for us to take a risk. And even if you're wrong, I think this is the way that, you know, if you never swing at a ball, you'll never hit one at all. So I think we have a real uh, culture of risk here. Um, so tonight, I want to talk about understanding the scriptures. Um, I don't know how far we'll get into this. I have several pages of notes. Um, it, but I'm going to give you lots of references. So if you're taking notes, I, in fact, I'd encourage you to take notes and at least write down at least the reference so you can go back and look at it later. And I feel like some of what I'm going to share, it might be, uh, well, I, I, it wouldn't be controversial in our, in our uh, circles, but it may be in other circles. Um, so um, I think it's important that we, we actually let the Scripture define the Scripture. So um, 2 Timothy 2.15, you'll probably uh, recognize most of these Scriptures. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. The first thing I want to say is this. is like we actually have to handle the word of truth. <laughs> it's kind of important that you read the Bible. And uh, uh, I, I uh, for a long time, I was the senior overseer. I still am the senior overseer of the prophetic people here. And, um, but for a long time, I was in the trenches, and Ben Armstrong's done such a wonderful job of kind of taking the whole prophetic movement to another level since he's been leading it in the trenches. And one of the things that I, we say to the prophetic people is, the depth of your understanding of the scripture will determine the depth of your prophetic declarations. And, and I, I, we've really, really encouraged, more than encouraged, if you're on our team, we actually insist that you have an ongoing relationship with the Bible, <laughs> that you actually know what the Bible says. Preferably, you read it every day. And I, I, I see reading the Bible kind of like eating. It's like some people, you know, there's, there's kind of a common uh, saying, you probably have heard it in your circles. You know, I, I went to church and my pastor didn't feed me. That is a really weird idea that you would go to church to be fed. But let me say, let me say it differently. That, that would be your only feeding place. That's a better way to say it. Yes, we should go to church to be fed, but it would be really strange, one, if you only ate once a week, and two, there would be something wrong with you physically or mentally in, in, a, in a natural if somebody had to feed you. So I, what I want to talk about tonight, I want to talk a little bit about feeding ourselves, and I want to talk about the Bible, and I want to say that um, I've, I've read the Bible nearly every day for probably at least 35 years, and twice a day for the last seven or eight years. And, um, and, and, uh, and by that, I'm not saying like I read for hours. I just say I have a relationship with the Bible. <laughs> I try to read it every morning when I get up, and I try to read it every night before I go to bed. Sometimes it's just a chapter. But I just I want to encourage you, like you probably won't read five chapters if you don't read one. And sometimes I just do it out of discipline. Often I just, I'm just opening the Bible. I'm reading a chapter. 
I'm thinking about it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right before I go to sleep. I'm asking questions about it. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me, give me insight. And I often pray this prayer, Holy Spirit, show me what seems to be unseen here in the scripture. And so I, I think it's really important. Um, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Could you put, uh, put about 50 minutes on the timer up there, please? Um, what? What? Oh, 12 minutes. So he said, he thinks I preach better in 12 minutes than I do in 50. I did a 12 minute, we, had, we were doing these 12 minute inspire things. If you didn't go to the conference, I'll tell you, we, we did these 12 minute inspire. So there's like four of them. We did two sets of four and I did one 12 minute and, and my whole team was like, he can never do it. He'll never stay. He can't even, he can't even get warmed up in 12 minutes. He can't even get people to get a date that soon. And I did it. I, I, pre, I, I shared for 12 minutes, and when I got down off the stage, you thought I think I'd got a gold medal for something. They were, that was amazing. Everybody was giving me high fives. It wasn't that the message was so good. It's that I actually finished in 12 minutes, and <laughs> so something that literally everyone could actually understand. So that was good. So put 50 minutes up there, please. <laughs> Forget what Bill just said. I want to talk about understanding the scriptures. Uh, years, many, many years ago, that um, what is now a studio right over here, where we uh, actually we have a, a main studio, but where's the studio where we, we mix um, the, uh, the the sound and, um, and I think maybe some of the visuals are in there. That used to that used to uh, kind of have a secondary use, and we used to put the nursing moms in there. We didn't have room, to, uh, we didn't have any other rooms for them. And so uh, we would kind of move the equipment to one side, put this kind of blanket wall in there, and put some seats in there, and there was already monitors in there, and the nursing mothers would go in there and nurse um, during the services. And on the door, it said, stop, nursing mothers only. <laughs> and one day I'm walking by that, and it's got a great big sign on it, stop, nursing mothers only. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it'd be really, you know, it'd be really troubling if you didn't actually know what was going on in there. If you just thought that that was a studio and you didn't know mothers were in there nursing, you could misunderstand the sign. Like, could it mean only stop nursing mothers? Everyone else can come in beyond this point. <laughs> if you're a nursing mother, stop. Can't come in here. Or could it mean we must stop mothers from nursing? Is it a protest sign like, mothers need to stop nursing, we need to give babies formula? <laughs> or could it mean everyone can nurse except for mothers? <laughs> if you're a father, you should nurse, but you shouldn't nurse if you're a mother. Now, those definitions are kind of stupid because we all know that the sign is not to mothers. The sign is to everyone else. Hey, don't come in here unless you're a nursing mother because mothers need privacy because they're nursing. Now, we all know that. But if you don't know what's going on inside, there are lots of interpretations of the sign if you just take the literal meaning of the sign. This so reminds me of the scriptures. Because people who have no relationship with God are translating the scriptures. They're interpreting the meaning of the Bible. And sometimes it's almost hilarious. I, I, I don't read a lot of commentaries. I just have never really gotten a habit of it. One of the reasons I never got in the habit of it is I had a study Bible um, when I, oh, not when I first got saved, a year or two after I got saved, someone gave me a study Bible. And the study Bible would have a little um, synopsis about the, uh, about the book, about each book. And it would say something like, um, this, this book uh, written to Timothy, supposedly by Paul, and here's the reasons why it probably wasn't the Apostle Paul who wrote this book. 
But the book opens, I, the Apostle Paul, to you, Timothy. I'm like, I don't actually need somebody who can't figure out that the first line's true to interpret the rest of the book for me. So I, I and I'm sure there's, you know, now Dan fairly tells me that my, my experience was very limited and probably not true. <laughs> but I'm teaching tonight and he has the night off. <laughs> that was a little joke. I'm simply saying, it's funny to me, no, it's really not funny like in a humorous way, it's troubling would be a better word, how some people translate the scriptures. And I'm like, you must not know what's going on in the room. People say things like, um, the miracles of the first century passed away with the apostles. I'm like, how did you come to that? Like Jesus said, greater works will you do when I go to be with the Father. In Mark 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And these are the signs of those who believe. <laughs> they'll cast out demons, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll eat, they drink deadly poison, it will not harm. And he gives them all these miracles, things you can't do unless God's with you. And he's like, these are the things he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Okay, this is what I mean by believe. These signs will follow people who really believe. Now, I know there are more scriptures than that, and I understand that there are people who don't walk in signs and wonders, and they love God and they believe. But my point is, is that how do we take the scriptures and decide for ourselves, like, well, that, that, he meant that for them, but he didn't mean it for us. And, and I'm like, you must not have been in the room. <laughs> Good point, Chris. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's not what God said, but what God's saying that causes us to be, give us, that gives us life. What God said tells us how God thinks. What God's saying tells us what God's thinking. For example, God says in Genesis chapter 22 to Abraham, take Isaac to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him. How many of you know this story? And so he takes Isaac to the top of the mountain, and you know, that's about three days journey. They get to the top of the mountain, and he's about to sacrifice Isaac. And then God says to him, Abraham, I provided a sacrifice. How many of you understand that if Abraham wasn't current with God. If Abraham only had the preceding word of God, not the proceeding of God, how many know God can't, man can't live by bread alone, by, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, not preceded? If Abraham isn't current with God, Isaac be dead. And what I'm getting at is that it's important to know what God said because that tells us, that teaches us how God thinks. But it's really important to know what God's currently saying to us. Because that tells us what God is actually saying to us. And how many know that the manna, Jesus talked about, that manna, the bread from heaven, is his word. You'll remember in the Old Testament that if they kept manna for more than one day, it's spoiled. The connotation is, is that, that the word of God needs to be fresh in our lives. Years ago, I had a dream and in the dream, this is kind of, have you ever tried to explain something that, that you experienced and then try to explain it with words? I've, I've put this dream in a book and read the book a year later and thought, well, it wasn't exactly like that. <laughs> so I'm trying to explain something. And you know how dreams, they kind of like, they kind of defy the laws of physics. Like in a dream, you can fly, right? And, and so... Um, this is a little bit of a, 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 a good but strange dream. In the dream, I saw words, like words like powerful, like courageous, uh, like holy, like noble. You know, just one word. Are you with me? And they were falling like rain. They were just falling like rain. And they were all the same size, and they were just falling like rain. And all of a sudden, in the dream, I heard, I'm giving you a new operating system. 
God said, I'm giving you a new operating system. And when he said, I'm giving you a new operating system, all of a sudden the words, this is the kind of hard part to explain, the words became alive. Like every word was alive. And it was, um, it was like 3D. It was like spinning and alive. And some of the words were really small and some of the words were really, really big. Like some of the words would take up the whole screen and if we were using it as an example, and some of the words were really tiny, like almost like small print, and they were spinning. And, and the words were, um, the, the, the easiest way I can explain it is they were like 3D. Like you could, you could look at it, you could look at the word holy from here, you could look at it this way, you could, you could actually like, like a car, you could lift the hood and see another dimension of the word, you could open the doors. It's a metaphor. You could open doors. You could see inside. What I'm getting at is that every word had dimensions inside and out. And then in the, wor- and then, and then in the dream, I started to breathe the words in. Like the word, uh, the one I remember is the word courage. I saw the word courage. And in the dream, I went, oh, and I breathed the word. I know you're looking at me like, weird. I wish Dan was up here. (laughs) In the, in the dream, I breathe in the word courage. And when I breathe the word courage in, I would suddenly take on the manifestation of courage. I'd suddenly be courageous. And, 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 you know, and each, each word I would breathe in, I would take on the characteristic of that word. But also the words had different characteristics, like there was different ways to view the same word. And then the Lord said to me, I'm giving you a new operating system because I'm about to pour out the spirit of revelation on this generation and that old wineskin will rip with a new revelation that I'm about to pour out on this generation. So I woke out of the dream. I remembered it was one of those dreams. You know, most dreams you wake up and you think you never forget it. Ten minutes later, it's gone. You're like, oh, no, what was that dream? I woke up out of the dream, and it was like burned into my mind. Like It was like the movie was still going when I was awake. It was, wasn't a dream easily, I could easily forget. And I, I was like, Lord, what does that mean, a new operating system? And I began to, and, and the, first, the first phrase I heard is this phrase. Not all truth is created equal. When I woke up, not all truth is created equal. And then I began to, I I, I started having all these scriptures come to my mind, and I started opening the scriptures, and I actually got up in the middle of the night, and I was like, what does this mean? And and how how do I, I, it's a new operating system. I need this operating system because I need the revelation. And so somehow this is a completely new operating system. Um, So, so in Isaiah 28, verse 10, it says, For precept must be on precept, and line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And I I began, especially that night, I began to see the truth had building blocks. It was precept upon precept, line upon line. For instance, you can't put your pants on, then put your underwear on. (laughs) You can't put your shoes on, then put your socks on. You can't build uh, the roof first on your house and then build the foundation. Like, there are, actually, there are actually truth is supposed to be built on top of truth. Are you with me? It's, in other words, it's not just important that it's um, true. It's also important what order truth comes in. Are you following me? Okay. And, um, and the second thing is, in um, Matthew chapter 23, a great example, Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and he calls them hypocrites, and he says, For you tithe, listen to this, mint, dill, and cumin, but have neglected, listen to this, the weightier, and some uh, versions say, the larger ver- pr- provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these things, uh, these are all things you should have done without neglecting the others. Okay, let me say this. So Jesus, they're, they're, they tithe all the way into their garden vegetables. And Jesus said, you do that, but you don't care about justice 
or compassion or mercy or faithfulness. He said, these are weightier. Okay, now back to my dream. See if this makes some sense to you. Tithing's important. But in the dream, I didn't see the word tithing in the dream, but just pretend I did. Tithing would be a word that big, and justice would be a word this big. It has more weight. Jesus is saying, all truth isn't created equally. You tithe, and that's small print on the page, but you don't care about justice and mercy and compassion. And I began to realize that sometimes we yell things that God is whispering. And we whisper things that God is yelling. And it matters, right? It, it, Jesus made all kinds of references to it. He said, you, you strain a gnat and you swallow a camel. What's he saying? He's saying, you strain a gnat like you find a little thing that's important and, and, and you're in, you think that's great, but then you swallow the whole camel. And he talked about, you have a, a log in your eye, speaking of a negative truth, something that's wrong, right? And you're trying to get a splinter out of someone else's. This is like where you're like, you're mad at someone because they, oh, they left the door open, but you lie all the time. <laughs> Sometimes we say, all sin's the same. I'd say that there are sins, there are sins that will kill you, according to 1 John, and there are other sins that will hurt you, but you won't die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we better leave that, because that'll, I'm just see how that's going to tweet right away. <laughs> Think about this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can quote it with me. But faith, hope, and love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. love. Faith, true, hope, important, love. How would you say these? Faith, hope, love. Are you with me? He said, but the greatest of these is love. What's he doing? He's saying love outweighs, all truth is not created equal. Love outweighs Faith and hope. Are faith and hope important? Of course. He that comes to God must believe that he is, must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. You can't even please God if you don't have faith. But God says that's how big love is. <laughs> he didn't say tithing. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I was trying to think of three others. But, but my <laughs> I'm saying God names two big things in the kingdom, faith and hope are pretty huge. But then he says, but if you have to choose, love's bigger than all of them. <laughs> See, I think that sometimes heresy is not necessarily, it's not necessarily things that aren't true, but sometimes they're things that have the wrong emphasis. <laughs> have you ever had somebody tell you something that you believe to, but you go, there's something wrong with the way they practice that? Like, like um, people, do you believe in angels? Somebody like, do you believe in angels? Like, I believe in angels. And then I have this 10-minute talk with them, and I'm like, not like that. <laughs> They're like, yeah, angels come to me, and you know, I pray, and, and angels come, in, and I'm like, oh, Paul talked about people who overemphasize angels didn't he? And it's like, okay, I believe in angels. I believe in everything you just said, but it's the application and the importance that you're giving to that that feels wrong, right? And yet I can't actually argue with their point because they're quoting scriptures, but something's still wrong. You know what perversion is? It's the wrong version, When truth is out of order, it creates disorder. Perversion is the wrong version. Think about this. Fatherhood and friendship. What happens if you reverse fatherhood and friendship? In other words, to my son, to my daughters. I'm a father and I'm a friend. Is it important that I get fatherhood 
ahead of friendship? Sure it is. Because if I reverse those, I end up with spoiled kids. How many, ki- how many parents do you know? You don't have to raise your hand. Maybe you're some of them. <laughs> or those of you who are watching by Bethel TV, it's definitely you. You're not in here. We blame you. <laughs> we always blame the people who aren't with us. That's just a little joke. But we have all met people, and maybe we've been those people, that you're, especially when your kids are in, you know, they're in their teen years, and you're trying to be their friend. You want to be their friend, and yet there's this tension of discipline. There's this tension of, should I let them go? And they're always like, Johnny's parents let them do whatever they wanted. They can stay up forever. They, they smoke marijuana with them. <laughs> and it's all legal now, and, and it's a plant God created. And I'm exaggerating to be funny. But my point is, is that they have friends who allow all of this, and you're like, I wanna be a friend to my daughter, to my son. But then I'm like, I have my first obligation is fatherhood. Maybe it's motherhood in your life. I am first a father, then I'm your friend. I love what Bill said something today, I, I, I think I wrote it down, but he said something like, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here, to, I'm not concerned about, I don't know what he said, it was awesome. <laughs> I posted it, I posted it. I posted it right after. I, yeah, I'm not here to keep you excited. I'm here for your destiny. That, that, that's a statement a father makes. He's not saying, I don't want you to be excited. He's not saying, I don't want you to have fun. He's saying, that's not my priority. (laughs) That's that's the fine print. The bigger print is, I'm here to make make sure you grow, that you're ready for life, that you're ready for your mate, that you're ready for the experiences you're going to have, that you're ready to have a relationship with God. That's my priority. I want you to have fun, but these are necessities. Right? What happens if I... What happens if I... um, Sorry. What happens if I reverse husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands? Oh, here we go. (laughs) Now it got really quiet. What happens if I reverse those? Like, first of all, let me ask you, do you think it's important that there's an order to this? Do you think it's important that husbands love your wives comes before or is, has more weight, or is weightier than wives submit to your husbands. I'd, pro- I'd propose that if you are demanding your wife to submit to you, that you should try the weightier thing. Because God said that love is the weightier thing, even more than faith or hope. I would imagine that submission is way down the order. Listen, important? Yes. Submitting ourselves one to another? Yes. Honor, important, yes. But how do I do that if I have someone who doesn't love me? Can I do it? Yes. Do I want to be in a marriage like that? Probably I need to go get some help. I remember a man many years ago, I, I had counseled his wife and, uh, and, 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 and given her some help. And she said, my husband's not a believer, but he'd like to come see you. Sure, have him come in. I was actually excited for him to come in because I kind of figured that he's 90% of the problem and I'm working with the 10. So in this situation. So anyway, he comes in. He's not a believer. He's really, really nervous. When I go to shake hands with him, he's trembling and he's sweating. So I'm trying to lighten it up, make it easy for him. And about 10 minutes into the, the, um, the session, he brings a Bible with him. It's a, it's a, it's a Bible you'd put on the table it was family Bibles. It's a great big thing. <laughs> it's just like this big, you know, it's not something you carry around. He brings it to the counseling session. I, I didn't actually know it was the Bible. He set it on a, on, uh, I thought it maybe was a counseling manual or something. He sets it on the, ch- on the chair and I was kind of like, the, you know, first 10 minutes I'm like, what is that thing, you know? Well, it turned out to be like a picture Bible, King James kid picture Bible, you know? And he opens, and so while I'm talking to him, you know, I'm talking to him, and I said, so, you know, what's your, because I had already heard her side. She met with me three times. I'm like, so, you know, you guys are having some challenges. What's, you know, how can I help you? What's the problem? He cracks open <laughs> the family Bible to 1 Corinthians 7, where it says that a wife 
has a duty to her husband, you know, to, for sex, for the act of marriage. And he goes, read that. She's not doing that. He doesn't even believe in God. <laughs> but he wants to use the Bible. It's okay. He wants to use the Bible to get her to do what he wants. How many you know that's a perversion? That's a perversion. <laughs> Some of you are like, I, I've done that before. <laughs> I tried reading Song of Solomon to my wife. <laughs> I got down to the navel. She's like, stop. <laughs> now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Bible. It's kind of important who is handling the Bible. For instance, in Luke chapter 4, it's also in Matthew 4, Jesus is interacting with the devil. And the devil, let me just read it to you, verse 8, Jesus answered him, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, serve him only. The devil asked him to bow down to him. And he led him into Jerusalem, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to them, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he shall command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they shall bear you up, so that you shall not strike your foot against a stone. Now, before we go on, that is an exact quote of Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. The devil just used the Bible against Jesus. And he just said to Jesus, um, let me quote what was written about you. I brought you up to the pinnacle temple, you can jump off. And the devil's trying to get Jesus to commit suicide. And he goes, you can jump off because it is written, and he uses the scripture against Jesus. And Jesus says to him, it is also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, my point is, I don't know if I actually articulate this right, but the scriptures in the hands of the devil is not true. The word of God and the spirit of God equal truth. The word of God, without the spirit of God, Jesus, Paul said, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. We're gonna see Jesus said uh, in, in John, oh, well, I got the wrong scripture here, but it was good, you'll like it. Jesus said in John 5, Verse 39, you search, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it's these that testify about me and you're unwilling to come to me to have life. So he said to the, to the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, you search the scriptures because you think you have life in the scriptures and yet the scriptures lead to me and you don't want to come to me. Listen, the goal of the Bible is not to memorize the Bible, it's to get to know the author. Now, it's great if you memorize the Bible, that's fine, but how many understand memorizing the Bible without getting to know the author is deception. People say, well, if you don't, if you, if you base your relationship with God on an experience, you can be deceived. How many know that's true? But if you have, a, but if you, if you memorize the entire, if you memorize the Bible, if you have a relationship with the Bible and it doesn't leave you into a relationship with God, you are already deceived. Some people say, all of the answers for life are in the Bible. That's not true. All the answers for life are in the author. How many would like to know where God would like you to work? How many would like to know who God would like you to marry? Oh, a lot more hands came up. <laughs> Can you find, listen, if your wife's name, your potential wife's name, not Mary, or Esther. <laughs> you know, you got about 30 people you can marry. <laughs> and if you're not going to be a carpenter or a shepherd, <laughs> you're in trouble. Ain't no IT people in here. <laughs> does God care where you work? Of course he does. Does he care who your mate is? Of course he does. Does he, have, does he have some input into that in your life? Of course he does. Are you going to find a verse for it? Probably not. I'm simply trying to demonstrate that not all, not all the answers for life are in the Bible, but all the answers for life 
or in the author, and the Bible's goal is to get you to know the author. <laughs> It'd be really weird if you sat outside and read the owner's manual to your car and never drove your car. So I've memorized the whole thing. Okay. Awesome. Years ago, one of my jobs when I first came here the first year, I, I didn't know anybody, and, and uh, I wasn't nearly as busy. And when we would have a conference, one of my jobs was to go pick up at least one or two of the conference speakers. So I didn't know any of the conference speakers. So typically, Judy, Bill's secretary, she would give me the brochure, and, and she would circle the, the person I'm picking up, you know, his picture. So I would go like, I remember picking up Bob Jones and Bobby Connors and Larry Randolph, and I didn't know any of these guys. And so they, she would take a Sharpie and she'd circle, this is the guy you're picking up. And I would put the picture, the brochure on the front seat, and I would go to the airport to pick him up. Now, how many of you know, I didn't have Bobby Connors in the front seat. I had a picture of Bobby Connors. And the goal is, is that when I saw him, I would know him. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God, listen to this, the Word of God is living, help me, and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of joint and spirit, both joints and marrow, and judge, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of life. Do you know you could destroy every Bible in the entire world, in every format, off of every computer, and wouldn't destroy the Word of God? Because the word of God, according to John 1, that the word of God, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word won't pass away. And his word was there before the world was made. The word was with God, and the word was God, and all things came into being through him, and without him, nothing came into being that came into being. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I, I believe that this is the inherent word of God. But I could eat this. <laughs> and it wouldn't benefit me. I remember years ago, I, I don't know if Bill remembers this, but when Bill, I think the first or second year that Bill came to Weaverville, we cleaned out the attic. And there was a whole bunch of old Bibles in there. Do you remember this? There was a whole bunch of old, like, I don't know, third edition King James Bibles. It was like the way back King James Bibles. And so we were cleaning all this stuff out, and there was, I don't know, there was a couple hundred of them. And Bill's like, take these Bibles to the dump. To the dump. It's the Word of God. I can't take the Word of God to the dump. <laughs> and we had, I don't know if you remember this, but, uh, but I remember it distinctly because I was like so troubled. Like, no, we can't take them to the dump. Like, what are you going to do with them? Let's burn them. Well, you can't burn the Bible. You can't burn the Bible like they burned the demon, the satanic stuff. They burned the satanic Bible. You can't burn the Bible. You can't burn the Word of God. And we're like, what do we do? Let's shred them. No, you can't shred the Word of God. <laughs> a lot of people are driving around with a brochure and thinking they have Bobby. See, I believe that every word in this book is an invitation to an experience. Remember in the dream, I saw the word courage and I breathed it in and I took on, I took on the nature of the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among me. What I'm getting at is that this Bible is an invitation. Every word is an invitation to an experience with God. I can read the word and not have an experience, but how many know that this Bible is an invitation to pick up the experience? Okay. I know. Here's an interesting piece of truth. Turn to Romans chapter 14. It's probably not going to have the impact it would if we read through the book of Romans. And by the way, the book of Romans is one of those books that, you know how we talked about 
10 minutes ago about line upon line, precept upon precept, how it builds here, there, here, a little, there, a little. You have to put the foundation on before you frame the house, and you have, to put, you have to frame the house before you put the roof on, that sort of thing. You have to put your underwear on before you put your pants on. You have to put your socks on before you put your shoes on, and there's kind of an order. Romans is really has an order. And by the way, there are big portions of the book of Romans that if you just take them by themselves, you will end up thinking that mothers shouldn't be nursing. You take Romans 7 by itself, where Paul said, you know, I, I, I realized that sin's in me, the very one who wants to do good, and he talks about how he's, he's struggling with sin. But if you read chapter 6 and you read chapter 8, you realize that he's talking about his life as a Pharisee. In fact, he opens chapter 7 with, you who understand the law. And he begins to talk about what it was like when he learned more and more of the word of God, but he didn't know God and he became guiltier and guiltier because the more he learned, the more he realized that he wasn't keeping the word, but he had no power to do it. And that's why Romans 8 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the word could not do, what the law could not do, weak as it was, God did by giving us his spirit. <laughs> well, if you read chapter 7 and you don't read chapter 6 and 8, then you're going to totally misunderstand what's happening in the studio. Are you, are you following me? So this is a book, that, the book of Romans. Paul is laying out a case for the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law in his flesh. And that you, if you receive Jesus, that you are sons of Abraham who lived for God 400 years before the law. And he was the father of faith, not father of the law. Are you with me? So he's talking through all of these things that you would know if you were Jews. And he tells them things like keeping the law and eating certain foods. You don't need to do that anymore because it was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus didn't nullify the law. He fulfilled the law. Are you with me? So then he starts talking in Romans 14 about two guys. Now, so you, you, the impact of this is 13 previous chapters. And he's basically telling you, like, you don't have to keep all of those laws anymore because you're in Christ. And he gets to this guy, verse four, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Now, accept the one who's weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Get this. Accept the one who is what? Weak in faith. For one person has faith that he may eat all things... But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Pause. I'd like to point out that if you're a vegetarian, the Apostle Paul, in the Word of God, said you're weak in faith. And of course, you would have to know the context to understand that he's not talking about vegetarians here. He's talking specifically about the law and people who do certain things to try to be righteous. Are you with me? So then he goes on to say, the one who eats is not, the one who's weak, I'm sorry, uh, he eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For God, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be, listen to this, fully convinced in his mind. He who observes a day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does it for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And the one who does not eat for the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks. Down to verse 14. I know and am convinced that in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks it's unclean, to him it's unclean. <laughs> Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or anything or do anything by which your brother stumbles. Okay, now, the impact of this is much greater than, those, than this paragraph because you would have to read the first 13 chapters to understand that Paul is building a case for the fact that the law has been fulfilled in Christ and all of these Levitical laws where people had to eat certain things and keep certain days, that those were all shadow 
of a relationship with God. So now, in relationship, we don't have the shadow anymore. We have the real thing. Okay, now he gets to this guy in chapter 14 who is not, who is keeping certain days and who's eating certain foods so he could be right with God. Now, how many understand he's theologically wrong? You would have to read the 13 chapters to know. The guy is theologically wrong. He's only eating vegetables when he could actually eat everything because in Christ, everything is clean. But he believes it's not. Is he wrong? He's theologically wrong, but he's relationally right. Paul's point is that even though he's wrong theologically, because he does it for the Lord, it's the business of the Lord to work it out, not you. And then he says to the guy who eats meat, for example, if you bring him over your house and you serve him meat and you put him under pressure to eat meat that he has no faith to eat, but he eats it because he feels pressure to, or somehow he eats the meat because there's nothing else to eat or whatever. He's in a situation where he eats the meat. You have caused your brother to stumble, not because you're theologically wrong, but because he has no faith for what you just caused him to do. Okay, what I'm getting at is this. Is theology important? Yes. But but Paul says, but relationship's more important. (laughs) And Paul says, a guy could have wrong theology and still have a relationship with God and be using his wrong theology to do the right thing. He has the right heart, he just has bad theology. We come in on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and we thrash people who don't get it exactly the way we see it. And we tell people like, this is the way it's gotta be. You are absolutely wrong. You're not even a believer. And Paul's like, hey, theology is important. Share with your brother your convictions. But ultimately, he has to work it out with the Lord. (laughs) The next part is really interesting. I believe that all truth is held in tension. Let me give you some examples. Jesus taught us to pray that we would not be led into temptation. Matthew chapter 16, chapter 6, verse 13 Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? Don't lead us into temptation. Did you notice in Matthew 4, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit, by the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Okay, let me try it again. (laughs) Did you notice that Jesus told us to pray that we would not be led into temptation? The will of God. But the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness, specifically to be tempted by the devil. Well, is it don't lead in temptation or lead in temptation? Here's another one. Paul teaches in Galatians 5.2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Paul wrote that. Acts chapter 16, verse 1, says that Paul took Timothy and circumcised him because his father was a Greek and her mother was a Jew. If I was Timothy, I'd be like, hey, remember that letter I helped you wrote? (laughs) Um, You said, let me see, let me find it. Whoa, 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 wait, put the knife down. You said, if I receive circumcision, Christ is no benefit of me. Whoa, whoa, get back. (laughs) Paul said to the Galatians, if you receive circumcision, Christ is no benefit to you whatsoever. He tells, he tells Timothy, come here, Tim. <laughs> and he, he, Paul, specifically circumcised Timothy because his father was a Greek. Is it circumcision or no circumcision? How about this? Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. I say to you, do not resist evil, an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. But in John Chapter 2, verse 14, he saw evil people, money changers at the table in the synagogues. And he went home and made a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple 
with the sheep and oxen, and he poured the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. <laughs> is it turn the other cheek, or is it go home and make a whip? <laughs> I, I, I made some comments on Facebook, which is always, I always love it, stir people up. And they're like, Jesus didn't really hit anybody. <laughs> or maybe he did. But he actually, he didn't like get enraged and just started turning over the tables. He actually went home, made a whip, came back. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Jesus, turn the other cheek. Jesus, you told us to turn the other cheek. Whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> Which one is it? The lamb or the lion? Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom's not of this world. But in Matthew chapter 6, he, he told us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But did you notice that Jesus said in John 18 that my kingdom is not of this world? And then he told us to pray that it would be? Okay. Oh, you're probably totally lost by now, right? You're like, can someone just tell me the point, please? <laughs> I went to Donald Miller's thing, and you're doing exactly what he said. I am lost, and I am daydreaming. <laughs> there are hundreds of these. People say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. No, the Bible's written in a paradox purposely so that you cannot live by principles you can only live by the prince. So you can learn all the principles of the Bible, then you don't know what to do. Because, the Bible, because Jesus said that the Spirit will teach you all truth. And the Spirit will lead you into all truth. And John said in 1 John, the anointing, you need no one to teach you, for the anointing that's in you will teach you. Wait a second, why am I reading the Bible? I'm reading the Bible to get God's, God's heart in me. But help me understand, I need the Holy Spirit to tell me, when do I, example, when do I apply the cheek, and when do I apply the whip? Do I circumcise or not circumcise? And by the way, there's many more. Do, is it faith? Is it by grace? Ephesians 2, 8, by grace you're saved, or is it James 2.17? If you have faith and have no works, your faith is dead. Which is it? Is it all by faith? Or do you have to have some action? And what I'm getting at is that the Bible was written so you have to have a relationship with God so you know what to do. Because it's not the Bible that leads you into all truth. It's the Spirit that leads you into all truth. Are you with me? I'll give you one more of those paradoxes. I love them. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus himself said, uh, I won't read the whole thing to you for the sake of time, but he said, in the last days, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And you can read it. It's Matthew 24. Actually, you can read the whole chapter. In verse 6, he says, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you not be frightened, for these things must take place, but it is not yet the end. But in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says that God... We'll judge between nations. Oh, wait, let me, let me give you the, the context. In, verse, in chapter 2, verse 2, it says it will come about in the last days. And in verse 4, it says that God will judge between nations. He will decide between many peoples. They will hammer their, spear, their, their, they will hammer their swords in the plowshares, their spears in the pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. When is that going to happen? In the last days. But Jesus said, in the last days, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. But Isaiah said, in the last days, they will no longer train for war. Which one is it? And all I'm getting at is that the Bible invites us into a relationship. One of the things that I like to do with our students is I like them to know both sides of the tension. Because sometimes I'm following, I'm, I, I get a verse, and I'm like, that's what I'm doing, I'm doing that. And I don't actually understand that all truth is held in tension. So I'll get up and I'll share a truth and I'll say, what's the other side of this coin? What's the tension? 
So someone will get up and say, I believe it's this verse. I'm like, that's right. This truth is held in tension. Now, what is the Holy Spirit telling you to do? Are you following me? And sometimes we have entire camps that are polarized on one side of the tension. And I'd propose that a way that a bow has power is that it's in tension. We have to live intentionally. (laughs) Are you following me? We live intentionally, and that's what gives the bow power. The more tension, the greater the strength of the bow. And the Word of God is living and active and powerful, and part of that is that we live in this tension, and I have to say, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me to do? Principles are great, especially when the Holy Spirit breathes on this one and says, this is what I want you to practice. Have you ever noticed when you post something on Facebook, if you don't know what the tension is, just post it on Facebook. (laughs) People will tell you what the other side is. Oh, yes, but the Bible says da 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 The last thing I want to point out is that many things in the Bible are documentaries, and many are commentaries. Some things God says, and it's, sometimes it's pretty easy, like when the bad guy does something in the story, you're like, God's not saying, be the bad guy. God's saying, that's what they did, right? So God tells this story about people, and then... In, in the documentary, there's often the commentary. But this is what I did. This is where I entered the story. For instance, Esther. How many of you love the story of Esther? I love the story of Esther. Did, did, you know, did you notice that she was in the king's? It wasn't just a beauty contest. It was also a sex contest. You just need to read the story. They stayed with the king. They came from the concubines, the harem. And then they stayed with the king all night. And then the king would take the next one, and the next one would stay with the king all night. They weren't playing checkers. <laughs> and what made Esther a beautiful story is she won. <laughs> if she wouldn't have won, it wouldn't have been a very great story. And I, I love Esther, but I don't think God's saying, this is how to make friends and influence people. <laughs> I think he's saying... This is the story of Esther, Mordecai, Haman, and so on. And he tells the story as a documentary, and then he goes, and here's where I entered into the story. If you don't understand that God often speaks into culture without acknowledging that culture is wrong or right, then you create perversions because you don't understand that God's documentary is not God's commentary. For instance, do you know that the war, the Civil War fought over slavery was largely perpetuated by Christians who Paul wrote to slaves and said, if you are a slave, serve your master as unto the Lord. And there was lots of stuff that Paul wrote about slavery to people who were slaves and to people who had slaves. So during the Civil War, there were a lot of believers like, they weren't, just, they weren't fighting so much for slavery, they were writing to protect the inerrancy of the scriptures. But what they didn't understand is, God wasn't saying it's okay to have slaves, God was saying you have slaves. So if you have slaves, you should treat them like you both have a God, who's over you both. And he began, and he wrote, are you making, am I making any sense? He wrote into culture. He didn't create the culture. He wrote into a culture that was already created. As if you would come in, somebody would come in and you'd say, you know, I have a boss who's very abusive. And you'd say, okay, well, here's how to deal with him. You're not saying it's okay for your boss to be abusive. You're saying, that's the situation you're in. Okay, here's my counsel to the situation that you're in. God wasn't saying, slavery's great. Be a slave. In fact, it said, for freedom, were we set free? (laughs) In Christ, we're free. Jesus came to set the captives free. But they didn't get that part because that was the other tension. And they only kept one tension. And it gave them permission to enslave humans by a Bible they didn't understand. And what I'm getting at, how important is it that we we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us his word? 
Otherwise, we end up thinking mothers shouldn't be nursing. It says it right on the wall. It says, don't, mothers, stop nursing. Stop nursing mothers. Mothers shouldn't nurse. God's in favor of formula. <laughs> and we can quote it right here. This is what it says right there. It's because you haven't been inside the studio and you don't know this is the place where nursing mothers nurse. And the, the, the sign isn't to anyone, isn't to nursing mothers. It's to everyone but nursing mothers. It's actually there to protect the mothers who are nursing. Are you following me? If you don't know that God wants to protect the mothers who are nursing, you can't understand the, the sign. Are you following me? I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would be our guide. I was going to say our spirit guide, but it's just getting too weird tonight. <laughs> that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And I really believe that the Lord wants to set us free from a religious spirit. And I think that there are some people in the room that the enemy has taken the scriptures and twisted them in your life. And you live under a shame because the scripture said such and such. And by the way, uh, example, like some of you are divorced. And by the way, God hates divorce. We all know that. God also got divorced. He divorced, divorced Israel. It's not okay. It happened. It was bad. How many of you know that the devil telling you God hates divorce after it's happened is not redemptive. <laughs> the devil using the scriptures about God hating divorce after you've passed through that season, after you've went through a hard time, and it's like, and using it to disqualify you, how many know those scriptures are important, but you're in a different season and God's redeeming you. Maybe you're watching by Bethel TV and you've gone through a tragedy and you, know, and you were wrong. You were wrong. You admit it, you're wrong. And you're you did something that the scripture said was wrong and you did it anyway and, and, and the enemy comes in and he's quoting scriptures to you all the time. How many know that when the, Bob, when the devil quotes scripture to you, how many know that's for condemnation? <laughs> and sometimes you think, well, because the Bible says it, I'm like, the enemy uses the Bible against Christians. He knows the Bible better than you do. He's been around a long time. But the spirit comes to free you. And how many know, what did Jesus use against the devil? He also used the Bible. It's really important that we accurately handle, what was the opening scripture? That we're workmen who know how to accurately handle the word of truth. That we know how to take the sword of the truth and we know how to use it to defend ourselves. We know how to use it to lead ourselves. We know how to use it to connect with God and get to know God. So can you stand? Let me pray for you. Okay. You know, um, I was thinking about, Paul said, it's with the heart that man believes, not the head. Head's important. Renewed mind's important. How many know it's the heart that believes? Would you put your hands on your heart right now? I'm going to pray for all of us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you want to lead us into all truth that you want to guide us, you want to lead us, you want to lead us into our promised land. Holy Spirit, you want us to rightly divide the word of truth. You want, a, the, you want the, the word that's sharper than a two-edged sword to cut off things in our life that shouldn't be there like a surgeon's scalpel. And Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you would come in here as a guide, as our leader, as our teacher, as our rabbi, as the one who leads us from faith to faith and glory to glory. And Lord, I just released that word to everyone, and I pray that we would grow our relationship with the Holy Spirit. If anybody's in here tonight, and, or maybe you're watching by Bethel TV, and you're just like, tonight, as I was sharing, you just feel that thing that you thought was maybe the Lord, you're like, oh, I can see it clearly now. That's the enemy doing what he did to Jesus at the mount. I'm sorry, at, 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 in the wilderness. If that's you, would just raise your hand. I want to pray for you right where you're at. I'm not going to have you come up. 
Would you just raise your hand right now? If you're watching by Bethel TV, just, just stand right where you're at and just accept this prayer. I feel like the Lord wants to bring, break condemnation off of people. Can you just raise your hand if that's you? Good, yeah. Just put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you if they have their hand up. We're just gonna pray right now that God breaks shame and condemnation. You know, Romans 8, Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we break the power of shame, people all over the place. We break the power of shame, we break the power of condemnation off of you in Jesus' name. We break the, the, even the, 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 the scriptures that were twisted to condemn you. Well, we break those off of you in Jesus' name, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you into the scriptures that, the, that, that, that God is, is, is sharing with you in your life. I just release those in your life right now, that you would have an end suddenly, that you would have an awakening that you would have a, 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 a epiphany that, that something would happen right now and you would just have the Holy Spirit say, this is what I'm saying to you. This is what I'm telling you to do. Lord, I bless every single person that's in this room and those who are watching by Bethel TV, I just release this word over you too. That right now that you would come out of the shackles and chains of condemnation and that, yes, we want conviction in our life, but we don't want shame. We don't want condemnation. We release peace in your life, and we release peace over all these folks right now in Jesus' name. How many of you want a greater understanding of the Bible? You want the Bible to come alive to you? I just, let's just pray that right now. I pray that the Bible would unfold to you. I, I, I had this experience uh, several times, actually, where I start reading the Bible, and it's, it feels like the Apostle Paul stands up and he begins to like do an audible. Like he begins to quote his own book to me. It's happened, probably, I don't know, five, six, ten times over a period of several years. I'm reading the Bible and all of a sudden it sounds like in my spirit like, like the, the author begins to just talk to me about his own book. And I, I just pray right now for the Bible to come alive for everyone who's watching. That it would no longer be dead. Like even tonight, you'd go home and like, I'm going to read that chapter. And you would actually have a connection with the Holy Spirit. Maybe there would be no angels or, or no goosebumps, but there was something you would be enlightened. Paul talked about Ephesians 1, that you would be enlightened. I pray that the Lord would enlighten you, that he would use his word to uncover things in your life. I mean good things, treasures, that as you read the, the Bible, that his love letter to you would come alive in you. And that you realize, oh, this is God's inherent word. This is, he spoke this right to me. If I would be the only one alive, he would have wrote this letter to me. And Lord, we just bless what you're doing right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. There may be some folks in here. Yeah, let's just give it up for the Lord. It's good. Before I finish... Who's coming up? Come on up. Before I finish, uh, there, there may be some folks in here, or definitely by watching Bethel TV, that you don't actually know the Lord. And, and this book, is, it's kind of a closed book to you. Like, you can get some history lessons out of it. And probably, you know, if you read this book before you knew the Lord, I, I tried to read this book for years. I, I wasn't a very, very good reader. But it, was, it seemed like the most boring book in the world. And then when I received Jesus, suddenly the book came alive. I'm like, I've never read a book like this. And, and if that's you, and you've, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. And by the way, we're not just talking about like, you know, repeating a prayer or just coming to a service. We're talking about you want Jesus to be your leader. You want him to forgive you for everything you've done wrong. And you're like, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I've, I've done my own thing. Or maybe you follow Jesus and you've, you like, you, you wandered away and you're like, I'm back. I'm back to the flock. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. And he also said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. And tonight I want to give you an opportunity just to step in and say, that's me. I'd like to just follow Jesus. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Would you just have the courage to say, I, I'd like to start following Jesus. Is that you right over there? Are you asking Jesus into your life? That's so beautiful. We love you. We bless you. Thank you. That was a really new beginning, too. And I, I um, you know, um, there's a story about uh, a man named Paul that when he, when he uh, connected to God, 
he actually, like blinders fell off his eyes and he can see. And I, I believe the Lord's opening your eyes to a, a world that's always been around you and God's always protected you. And he's going he's gonna to initiate a, a new uh, dimension in life for you. I bless that in you. Is there anyone else you would like to receive Jesus or come back? Would you just uh, wait, wait, wave your hand so I could see it? Is there someone over there? Oh, yeah. We just bless what God's doing in you too. We just celebrate you. You know, Jesus himself said that the angels party when someone comes into the kingdom. He said the angels rejoice to have a party.